All right, we might get started. Uh, there might be a few people coming in, but good to see you all still here. Uh, for those of you who haven't uh, been here this morning or don't know me, it's my name, Greg Mulholland up there. I'm a systems engineer uh, and I work predominantly with our partners and our alliances um, in the, across ANZ, um, across pretty much all of our technology, so you know, through virtualization, cloud, end user computing as well. This session, we're going to go into a little bit about some considerations when upgrading to, to VC. By way of a show of hands, I guess, can I understand who at this point in time is in already using VC 5.1? Okay, cool. 5.0? Right. Anyone 4.1, 4.0 or earlier? Right. Okay. Anyone earlier than 4.0? No, just because he was the first one that I saw put his hand up. But anyway, so well done, you winner. I was going to give out a, a, a like a, a one session I did last year. We did the same sort of thing. And we got down to, we asked, actually Nathan and I did the session at B-Forum. We asked everyone to stand up and sit down when, it's, you know, when, you, when you're using vSphere, whatever version in production. And we got down to someone who was still using 3.02 or something like that in production. And we actually, we were going to give out, we gave out just a present to them, but we were going to give out a virtualization for dummy book and said, here you go, you actually need this to get yourself to where you need to be. But um, in any case, so we'll, sorry. Yeah, okay, well, come into the office and see me and you can have a Mentos or something like that. Um, <laughs> um, that's pretty good. We actually had a lady who had 2.5 or something like that in, not in production, but uh, yeah, um, pretty interesting. It's good, to, good to see that that sort of stuff is, is still out there in a way. It's weird, but anyway. So I'm going to go through a little bit about uh, about vCenter. So vCenter is obviously a major component, particularly if you're going from from yeah you know, 4.1, 4.0, or, or um, 4.1 and 5 to 5.1, it's a major component and there's a lot of things to think about. Um, through the host upgrade as well, a number of different ways to do that, some considerations to think about. And we'll also look at upgrading virtual machines and, and VMSS if you need to do so as well. So we break down our um, upgrade, I guess, into a number of phases. Um, phase you know, two, if you go back through um, the manuals and, and I would encourage you if any of you guys are looking at doing the upgrade process and hopefully the reason why you're here but that upgrade process. The first step I would say to you is go and get the documentation, go and get the release notes particularly for 5.1 and understand what the requirements are. Start building yourself a bit of a checklist as to what you need to do to first understand what your environment currently looks like, what components are where, who has control of them and things like that. Um, and then also understand the, the prerequisites that need to be in place for that to happen. So you'll see with vCenter there are some specific ones and there's a specific order as, as well that we have to execute these steps for it to be a successful upgrade. It's not terribly difficult. Probably some of you have already done it and, and used to doing it in certain areas or certain ways with previous versions, um, but we'll go through and, and just sort of step those out a little bit. So most of you are lucky, other than a few people in the room where you've got a, a supported upgrade path um, through to 5.1, but again, those, those considerations we need to understand. We'll start first of all with vCenter. So a major change in vCenter 5.1 is the aspect of single sign-on. There's now a single sign-on in, in vCenter 1. If you weren't in my session earlier, which I touched on it, and any of the other sessions today, we now have a single sign-on capability that allows you to authenticate in one spot and then have access to multiple different vCenters that might be in your, in your environment. Um, from the perspective of, of doing this for, in, in the upgrade sense, what we need to do is essentially start building that, that capability in our new environment first and foremost. If you're looking for, I guess, a greenfield type of implementation or a new, new, new environment, um, and it's a relatively small environment. You don't have specific you know, high availability, availability considerations for things like C 
single sign-on and other components of vCenter, then probably starting at the simple install is the easiest spot to start. This is what you know, I do and probably Mike talked about. His lab, it's pretty simple, right? You run through the, it goes through the different parts of the installation for you. You do the inventory server itself, um, inventory service, um, and then you move through into the vCenter and then you'll install the last part of it, which would be the, the web client, the vSphere web client, which is a replacement, essentially, the, the old client, the GUI client that you're still used to is still there. But there's now this new web client which allows you to address or to, to have visibility of multiple vSphere or vCenter environments in the one web client. Um, likewise, it'll run on Mac, Linux, anything that basically has a web uh, um, thing, with the exception of, of um, you know, it's built on Adobe Flex. So of course it needs the, uh, the, the correct tablet device to be able to address those sorts of, those sorts of things. But for those of you running Mac and things like that as, a, as an operating system at work, you don't now have to have Fusion or something like that which you use a virtual machine which is Windows just so you can have access to the cloud. Likewise, just as a side note for that, new features and things like that that we're bringing out in this version of, of vSphere 5.1 and vCenter are going to be all generally speaking available in the, in the web client and potentially not available in the C-sharp client. So I'd encourage you when you have a look at it, um, if you do get a chance to have a look at it, to have a bit of a play with it and start to see some of the nice views and capabilities that it now has. Um, if you're going to do a more sort of custom and then certainly a stage upgrade approach and things like that, then obviously the individual component install is the best way to do it. You've got greater control over where you start, where you stop, and things like that, so it's not a, a pre can sort of a, a, a run for you. Um, so, you know, obviously I, I mentioned the first thing is, is to read release notes, check the install guide. There's a lot of documentation that VMware makes available to our, to our customers, um, and it's the best source of actually creating yourself that checklist, um, especially if you're doing a large environment, you know, and potentially um, a complex environment, this is the place to go. If you need additional help with that, of course, you know, the VMware is more than willing to help. But these things are the best way to do it. In terms of upgrade order in itself, I mentioned the single sign-on capability and the importance of getting that into the environment for vCenter um, for this 5.1 implementation first and foremost. Um, you may do the, up, the, the web client things like that so you've got capability to check those sorts of things. The inventory service is now obviously split out into a separate service that can be a server and static we need to. So again we had some um, requirements for, for some of our larger some of the large instances to some of the compare of the now. Uh, so I guess scales and things we have people to come that web client, these sorts of things on a completely separate server so that no one is actually really addressing the vCenter server that is if they if they really don't need to. Um, and lastly of course the upgrade of vCenter is, is the, uh, the last piece of that. One thing I will mention if uh, if you're looking for upgrades from Windows to to use a vCenter appliance, um, there's no in place upgrade. There is a sling, um, an inventory snapshot sling that we have available as part of a demo or you know a, a non-supported tool essentially that allows you to capture some of that configuration. As it mentioned there as well, it doesn't capture performance stats and all those sorts of things. So if you need that history, then you know, you'll need to think about what, you, what you're doing there. But we have a lot of customers now looking at the appliance model, which you know in certain installations doesn't require a large v Windows server or something like that just to run just to run vCenter. Um, so yeah, possible but um, probably not a, a great way to do it at this point in time. And the last one is, is pretty important. There is an outage required for the vCenter upgrade in itself. Um, the hosts and things like that can, can you know be done in, in other ways. Um, but you'll need to ensure that you can schedule some downtime for that point in, in time when, you, when you're doing the vCenter upgrade. From a host perspective, two ways to do it, generally. Um, 
This is the upgrade, this is the fresh install. Now, when would you choose to upgrade? And, and I'll clarify these points at the end of the slide because I have a personal view on this to be honest, but when you've got a large number of hosts and the administrative input to upgrade all, to, to reinstall all those hosts is, is difficult, um, then you may look at choosing just a simply an upgrade. The, as it says, there factors to consider is you know to use the automated methods and things like that. Now, on the back of that, when you're doing small number of posts and things like that, it might be just as easy to simply do fresh installation. In the environments, and this is my clarification point to this, in the environments that I've worked in and the, the situations I've been placed in, even through the large installations, typically the large installations I've seen and been involved in it, it's more important to have build processes and operational processes that are not caught, not having um, a lot of burden, administrative burden, for, for these large installations. So to be able to scale effectively and, and rapidly in a large customer, we still need to have processes around how do I deploy 30 new hosts in a, in a fairly quick space of time. So to me, if I've got that process already sitting there and ready to go, and the operational overhead of me selecting host profiles or having auto-deploy which builds the servers with all the correct builds and all the bits and pieces, then to me doing an upgrade is not really saving me a, a lot of time. So if, if the way you actually are structured allows you to do a reinstall, then in my opinion, I'd, I'd be more than happy to do a reinstall. But it was always a sort of a, in my Windows days, I guess as a sysadmin, I always looked at, you know, would I upgrade Windows 2003 to Windows 2008 or do I build another box or another VM in parallel on Windows 2008 and just migrate the services or the data over? The answer to me was pretty simple. I just build a new one, right? I, I hated doing upgrades. Um, I'll, I'll hopefully I'll go through this in a little bit because there's a few slides on some areas where it may or may not make sense as well, right? So I'll see whether or not it's, it's part of the next couple of slides. If it's not, remind me, I'll come back to you. Um, so a couple of easy ways to, to do it, obviously, as, a, as an install from the ISO, which you're all sort of used to doing. You run the install, you choose the migrate option, the upgrade's done, the box reboots, configuration is all still there. Pretty easy, pretty simple. If you do, if you to do it on a test host, this is as simple as, as you can possibly get it. You can do it in a VM. Install ESXi in a VM, 5.1 or 5.0 in a VM. Attach the ISO, the 5.1 ISO to it, and, and do the upgrade. And you'll see how, how simple it actually is. Um, Upset manages the other thing. So I used to, I got to the point where, in my early days of all this sort of stuff, I would go home and after dinner I'd log in and I'd kick off remediation, I'd see a bunch of hosts in the cluster all going, going and going and then all of a sudden they'd all reboot and they'd all be a different thing. And I still remember to this day taking a screenshot and sending it to a friend and saying, look how cool this is. I don't even have to be at work anymore to do any work. I can, you know, go home. I can go home and work and I don't have to stay at work and work. Didn't quite sort of work too well with the wife, but anyway, she's got used to me now. Um, and the last one, I guess, is scripted upgrades. So I know a lot of customers who have some scripting capabilities on staff um, and they have created some of their own configuration, their own build processes and things like that that allow you to just roll these, roll these out by, by different methods. So whatever your flavour of reinstallation or upgrade is, um, whatever makes sense to you, I guess. Um, upgrading the host. So first and foremost is to obviously check the compatibility guide, make sure that um, that the hardware that's in the box and things like that is going to support or is actually supported in the version that you're actually upgrading it to. Um, mentioned before upgrading vCenter uh, 5, so you can manage early hosts and things like that. There is a migration, a, a rolling migration sort of thing which we'll, we'll, I'll show you in a, in a little bit which allows you to do it all, uh, all, all fairly easily. The reason probably why you may get yourself, um, you've got to be careful 
is that potentially if you've got, as it says there, third party images, so if you've got a Dell image that is, you know, for, for 4.1 or 5.0 or something like that, and the 5.1 is not out yet when you decide to do your upgrades, all those sorts of things. Make sure that you understand that the image that you're going to upgrade to is the image that you're upgrading from. So if you've got a Dell image that you're using in production now and you want to go to 5.1, then you're going to go to the vanilla ESX, you know, sorry, VMware 5.1, or you're going to wait for the vendor specific ones with drivers and all those things, etc., to be there. Of course, in the ESX days, before ESX... Hello. You have been conducting a meeting for a long period of time. If you need to continue meeting, press 1 now. If not, I'll end the meeting. Specific images or vids or things like that that are part of a host build, uh, make sure that that's part of your upgrade path or upgrade document as well. So, you know, we have customers we were talking just before next door about, um, you know, VXLAN and all the different vids and things like that we might have as part of our host build so that these hosts can participate in VXLAN clusters and things like that. Make sure that when we're doing the rebuild or doing an upgrade that we're going to make these, we're going to rebuild like for life. In order to avoid downtime, use things like HA and DRS. Um, maintenance mode and all those sorts of things are, are really good. Um, storage vMotion, vMotion. Um, to, to this point, I guess, as well, as far as having a cluster that you're upgrading, you can mix and match. So obviously, you're not going to be able to upgrade every single host in a cluster at one point in, uh, at, at the same time. So what you'll more than likely do is you'll do a bunch of them, you'll do a rolling upgrade. So you'll continuously roll new hosts over um, inside the cluster until you get to that point where they're all at the same level. Take a bit. Um, and I can't quite do what I need to do. You, can, you could use a 60 day trial license to be able to get yourself to a certain level of enabling these sorts of um, techniques that help the upgrade run a lot smoother. And, and this all, is all about zero downtime for the application essentially, right? The host can go down. We don't care about that. I mean, you know, we don't like seeing our host down, but from an application perspective or the end user's perspective, they just want the application up. They don't, they don't really want. Um, Standardised configuration and things like that, there's multiple ways to do that. The host profiles is probably one of the, one of the best. There's a number of scripts and patterns. Look, I've been guilty of running PowerCLI to do complete configurations of environments um, prior to having access to host profiles um, and, and all those sorts of things as well. Rolling upgrades is, is, is what I mentioned here. So essentially allowing that sort of you know, we've got a cluster here that we've upgraded vCenter, we turn on HADRS using story, uh, vMotion, things like that. So we'll move everything off onto one, we'll do the upgrade of that host, we'll do the next one, yeah, we'll, we'll continuously roll through. The point there about VMware tools um, is interesting and, and I'll mention this when I get to the VMware tools section, but it's important that you don't rush ahead and particularly with VMware, not so much with VMware tools, um, but with virtual uh, machine hardware version is that you actually don't upgrade until you've eventually got right to the end. It's not backwards compatible. So for instance, in VC 5.1 there's what we call the compatibility, which is 5.1, which is essentially hardware version 9. We've just renamed it or relabeled it. So it's, you know, tools version, or vCenter 5.1, ESX 5.1, tools 5.1, compatibility 5.1. So it's all the same. Um, but that's not backwards compatible. So essentially if you go and do all your hardware upgrades and things like that, you'll find that some VMs won't run, and potentially if you're using you know, DRS and things like that, those things can cause a problem if they start moving around because they're not compatible with the host that you haven't yet upgraded. Yes? Yeah. Not 
that I'm aware of. I might have to have a chat later on more to get some more detail. Um, so this is this is important as well when you're doing the upgrade process, and I mentioned how easy it is. But this is a little bit of an explanation as to what actually happens. Um, the boot disk essentially is not repartitioned, so there won't be any loss, particularly of, of configuration details and things like that, when you're doing the upgrade. Um, it's all preserved. Uh, these slides again that build out themselves. So we do a copy of the configuration over onto the uh, partition, and then when the upgrade's done, we restore that back onto there. So the config that's there should be essentially still in place. It's just a rolling upgrade to the new version that we're doing. So very, very simple. Um, so key considerations here too, obviously for some of you, I don't know whether any of you are still using ESX, uh, but moving to the ESXi, we need to ensure that, uh, again, the, the console's going away. Anything we've scripted or put inside as a piece of additional software that we may use um, is there. We also need to make sure that any vendors that, are, that we're working with at that point in time have specific um, support for the new version of ESXi and 5.1. Um, so make sure that if you've got any attachments, that ecosystem around your host for, for other vendors and things like that is, is there as well. Um, so again, upgrade from 4.0, preserve the host configuration, etc. Um, scratch directory. So this is what happens again, the configuration over here. We just upgrade that part of it. We do the restore of the configuration back to there. So pretty, pretty simple from an ESX to an ESXi perspective as well. Same, same deal. Couldn't, couldn't be much, much simpler. Um, limitations. We've mentioned some of them. The service console is not there, um, or not there, and certainly not preserved or anything there. Um, have a look at. I mentioned third-party software. Look at users, firewall rules, anything, particularly any custom config. This is where it becomes really important to either to, to know what your environment is and know what sort of build documentation that you've got and to be able to reference that at any point in time to make sure that your upgrade is going to go smoothly. Um, there is a tool available for um, uh, on our website, the VMware Labs website, which is ESX Analyzer essentially, which allows you to go and download this tool, and I would encourage you if you're going through this process to go and download this tool, run it against your environment, and you'll probably find that it'll just essentially go through and collect any information that you may need to think about when you're going to do this process. So you may have the process down, you may be fairly straightforward to, to go through, document it, execute a test and all those sorts of things, but this thing being a free tool is probably something worth, for those of you that need to, probably something worth going through and actually, actually checking. From the virtual machine perspective, I mentioned we've now got VMware Tools 5.1, so when you upgrade a, a virtual machine in vCenter, uh, you'll be able to upgrade the, the VMware Tools on that VM to 5.1. Um, likewise, virtual hardware 9, which is, again, like I said, now VM compatibility, so we've got... Essentially, I always had this problem where I would look at a virtual machine and look at the hardware version 7 or hardware version 4, and then could never remember whether it was up to date relative to the host or you know, vCenter or whatever that it was actually sitting in. So at least now I know that if my environment is a you know, cluster of 5.1 hosts, then I've got all the right things just looking straight across it. Maybe that was just my day. Um, again, the VMware tools is optional. There's no requirement for you once you've done this process. So obviously we've gone through vCenter, gone through the host perspective. And now looking at virtual uh, tools and things like that, there is no real requirement to do it, as in it's optional, but you'll probably find that, and I think I've got something to show you on it a little bit later on, and particularly in the hardware version, that there might be some additional drivers, additional capabilities, uh, and things like that that would benefit you from, from actually upgrading it um, as well. Um, I mentioned the tools are forward and backward compatible. So don't be afraid that you'll be in a situation where that virtual machine potentially is going to have a problem living on, on a different host, uh, particularly during the time you're doing the upgrade. Um, but otherwise, uh, it's, it's pretty, pretty cool. Uh, 
virtual hardware is not compatible, uh, however, um, so you should sort of wait till right to the end until, until you get to that point. And here's why. So when you say upgrade, why would I upgrade to you know, version 5.1, compatibility 5.1? The reason is because if I leave my virtual machine still sitting there, what I'm going to have is these, these features like guest OS, storage reclamation, so view um, virtual machines, things like um, 64 of these CPUs and things like that, those sorts of features, additional capabilities that are now part of you know, new virtual machines essentially in this capability range, um, you won't have that if you don't go and do this. So, again, it's up to you. You don't have to, but essentially you may ever... There's, there's no um, downside, I guess, to, to doing this, and there's probably the only downside I can think of not really is not having everything standardised on the current version and potentially missing out on some of these features. And I guess last but not least is, is looking at VMFS. I had a, a gentleman I'm just standing in the room, see so if he's here, uh, talking to me about VMFS from 3 to 5 um, previously. So it's not essential, again, that, that you go and upgrade to, uh, to VMFS 3. The good news is it's very straightforward. Um, and there's really no disruption to, to, to do that. So the, the caveat there is obviously you need to be at a certain level of host, which is fine, most people will be in this room. Um, there's no real disruption to virtual machines living on that VMFS data store, um, and there's no, I guess, uh, problem to, to, do, to doing so. We've, we've done it many, many times. The real reason why you would go and actually bother to do this, whether it's a sand line or, or whatever, is you get a number of different a number of different uh, capabilities. First and foremost is the 64-bit data store. So at the moment, the two terabyte data store, or around about two terabyte data store, is essentially the maximum that we can have with VMFS 3. Now, this customer essentially had um, file servers that had multiple VMDKs that was obviously larger than two terabytes that could fit inside one data store. And what happened, what they had was a number of data stores that were living all over the place that they wanted to cluster, and VMDKs each lived in, in a whole bunch of different data stores. Now, there's probably reasons, good and bad reasons why that would be the case, but in this sense, you can create one data store which is completely contains all of the VMDKs for that file system. So, 64 terabyte VMFS data store now. Likewise, Additional capabilities if you've got if you're using RDMs, anyone uh, using RDMs can can access or can utilise 64 terabyte RDMs as well. Um, you get a unified block size with VMFS 5. So you remember when we always had the discussion, and probably some of you have had it already. When I create a data store, do I use a one meg, or two meg, or four meg, or eight meg block size? And what happens when I try and storage the motion between them, and things kind of don't look, you know, and People give their own two cents and all this sort of stuff. VMFS 5, just, it's just not even a discussion anymore, right? So a, a standard unified um, one meg block size. Additional locking mechanism improvements and things like that, so a much more robust file, file structure, data store structure, um, more efficient, all those sorts of things. So if you ask me why not to do it, I, I, I can't. The only reason I could give you is because you're using NFS. Um, so some, uh, a few extra things. Probably the main one here to point out that I would say is around the partition format. So the specific question I was talking to a customer in the break about was, we've got these VMFS 3 data stores and we've upgraded them to VMFS 5. Now what happens? As it says there, VMFS 3 data store is partitioned with a MBR format. Then the fiber position with GPT. So essentially, there's a seamless switch when the data. So if you upgrade a VMFS 3 data store to VMFS 5 non disruptively, then as soon as that data store starts growing larger than 2 terabytes, if you've you know, got space in the line, blah, 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 then you'll start to get the, the seamless switch to GPT as a partition format will allow you to grow that essentially out to 64 terabytes as the maximum we support. So, Yes, you can do all those sorts of things and, and, and increase the size and stuff like that. I, I still look at it as a bit of that 
should I upgrade or should I do a fresh install? If I've got the capability to provision a new LUN, create a data store on it, you know, with, with VMFS5 and all that sort of stuff straight from the word go, then, then probably I'd do that and I'd give the LUN back to, you know, the data, what the data store or, or give the LUN back to the storage guys and say, no, you can have it back. So, um, your choice. Oh, pretty much exactly what I just said. So, I mentioned it's dead easy. Here we're just looking at pretty much just the data store um, view of our, uh, in our client here. We just select the data store and we go upgrade VMFS5. I've done it. Um, VMs are all running inside the data store. No real issues. No issues, so I should say. No real issues. Um, look, I mean, it's, you know, probably if you're doing it in production, you may storage the motion things out and all that sort of stuff, but there's no, the, the documentation, as I said, goes through this particular process and there's no, it's a non-destructive update. Um, we've mentioned that, update all hosts. So, if you're going to do this in a mixed mode sort of thing, this is, uh, I've been sort of saying all, all along to do everything in stage processes. So, remember the phase process we were talking about before? I would only ever get to, you know, virtual hardware, VMware tools, virtual hardware and VMFS, right to the point where I know that the environment, or at least the cluster that I'm dealing with, if we talk about a silo sort of thing, like Mike was talking about this morning, I would only ever get to that point where that cluster that I'm dealing with, or that point of management, is ready to go to VMFS 5. And there's no way, or no real reason, for me to ever go back. Because as it says, it's a one-way upgrade. Once you upgrade it, you ain't going back to three. Um, Schedule them in non peak hours again. General common sense when doing this sort of stuff is um, try not to impact the production uh, guys because they, they don't like it, and particularly when you get application guys screaming down the phone at the operations guys and the infrastructure guys, it, it tends uh, not, to, not to be terribly uh, well. So, just in summary, stage process, they send it first. Make sure. Uh, I've Make sure you get your checklist sorted. Read all the right documentation. There's plenty available on the vSphere. So when you go and look at vSphere 5.1 documentation on our website, you'll see all the relevant documentation, release notes, upgrade guides, install guides, all that sort of stuff that you need to start building yourself a checklist, a run book of how your upgrade's going to go. You'll obviously know what sort of method you're going to use um, because you've probably you know, either got some sort of solution there already. Start with vCenter, start with components like single sign-on. Again, all this is part of the, part of the, the, the documentation. But start with single sign-on, build out the extra components as you see that this environment is going to scale, whatever the requirements are specifically for it. And then move on to your host, whichever, whichever you determine whether it's going to be an in-place upgrade or whether it's a fresh install with a new configuration or exactly the same configuration um, from it. Um, go on from there to things like upgrading the VM components, VM tools, virtual hardware and things like that, and then go through and look at your storage as well. And probably by the time you get to the end of it, you'll find that you've got a nice, uh, beautiful vSphere 5.1 environment that's all supported together and running, running well. And it's really not terribly hard. I'm sure many of you guys have done some sort of a, a vSphere upgrading. At times, it's, it's um, one of those things that you know, the best plans, or the, the, the planning that goes into it is really the thing that makes it a lot easier. And like I said, you probably get to the stage where you're sitting at home and just firing off a button and letting it be all happen if you've got the, the capability to be able to do that. Just in finishing, if ever, anyone hasn't, it's still going to stick around, which is good because we're all probably very thirsty for a beer. Um, if you have a, a laptop or something like that, I'd encourage you, the hands-on labs, which are the things we run at um, VMworld and VForum and all those sorts of things, which has all been updated recently with all our new kit, all this sort of stuff, um, all the vCloud stuff and networking stuff that we've got, SRM, any of these bits and pieces that you think. It doesn't take very long at all. You can go literally there and go and log in. So if you've got a laptop and you've got a few minutes to spare, it's just down the end. Um, in one of the rooms there's a site, you know, pretty much out like the one out front of here. And you just go through and just sit down for half an hour and do a lab and 
maybe get a little bit of hands-on experience or knowledge on something that either hasn't been covered here or something you just want to have your hands on. Um, Otherwise, I think we're pretty much done. I'll be around. And there's a few uh, mingling sessions and stuff like that outside afterwards and then we're going to go and have a beer somewhere. So thank you very much for staying along. It's a good turnout. <laughs>